the head of that network said to me, um, no, um, boxing isn't ready for, yeah, the boxing world, something like the boxing world isn't ready for a woman. And I was like, for a woman to talk about boxing. It felt amazing to host a heavyweight world title fight and actually be the first woman to do to, so, and actually the first woman to work in boxing um, globally because <laughs> I wanted to do that from a very young age. I was a massive boxing fan. I used to read like, you know, I've still got loads of Muhammad Ali books. I used to read his books from such a young age. I don't even know why. And I just really, really loved it. And I think I loved it because to me, it just, I don't know, it's probably more about what have, what, the stories were off the ring and out of the ring, but I just felt like it took so much strength and and I just loved the sport and I still do. I still train. In fact, I've got a boxing gym just down the road. And I don't know, I just was so passionate about, about the skill of boxing, about, you know, the mental side of it and the amazing human stories and the fact that what you can use the boxing ring um, as a tool and as a voice um, you know, no matter who you are, somebody like Muhammad Ali or, you know, it's a great place for people that have have been, it gives opportunities to people that, you know, maybe haven't had them from a young age. And so when I did that, I was like, oh my gosh, because I remember when I was a child and I was like, I was like, oh, I'd love to like stand on, stand by the ring and, and you know, be behind the microphone. And I, just, I think I just like planted that in my head but the other reason why is when I first opened the door into a certain person's office and said um you know I'd really love to for you to give me an opportunity on your boxing team and I was already part of that network I was already doing really well there and then you know I trained in boxing you know I, I'd been in the ring I fought like I just was so passionate about it and knew it so well and <laughs> the this person isn't in their job now but the head of that network said to me um no um boxing isn't ready for yeah the boxing world something like the boxing world isn't ready for a woman and I was like for a woman to talk about boxing something that you know women don't talk about and I was like this was just before this was before the Olympic Games in 2012 so it was before women were allowed to box in the Olympics which Nicola Adams went and did and, and won gold which is incredible and then um, <laughs> I, I was like what do you mean? And I was gen. I mean, you know, and I was kind of shocked, but at the same time, I was you know, so used to those attitudes in a way. And then um, I was like, yeah, but like, what? May why does it mean that I, you know, because I'm a woman, that I don't know or can't talk about boxing? And in fact, if I look at the team, like, you know, I'm the one that trains in it and knows it so well. And, you know, I learned how to you know, commentate, I learned how to score, like all these things, but I also trained in it. I knew the sport. I was so passionate about it. And I was like, why can't, you know, there are women boxers, there are pro boxers at the time, there was professional female boxers, even though, but it's grown so much now. And so I remember walking out in the office and shutting the door and being like, like I genuinely was, I don't even mind saying it. I genuinely was like, how do you, ah! I was like this. And I remember walking out of the office and I was like, right I was like and and it just it was like holding a red rag to a ball because I was just like I'm gonna prove you wrong and I just tried and I tried and I tried so hard to show that you know that I knew boxing so when I was because I did a little bit of boxing you know in when I was presenting Sky Sports News so whenever there was a boxing segment I'd make sure I asked to present it and then when women were allowed to box in the Olympic Games I used the opportunity to say, well, you know, can I cover the women then? You know, and then at the same time, I was like, well, you know, you might as well let me cover the men too. <laughs> and then it grew from there. So, uh, you know, and I think there's a massive message in that, you know, if somebody says you can't do something, it doesn't mean they're right. I, I think what I did was I just never gave up. So, you know, I, I had so many people turn around and say, you know, I mean, I was tall and I was like very blonde then. <laughs> I'm not now. Um, and I think people looked at me and was like, you know, uh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. That horrible, I hate it so much, that horrible stereotype where it's like you're judged on the way you look. No matter how you look, you're judged on it. And it's like, 
hang on, see past, you know, the book cover. Um, and I think also like I had a really broad Yorkshire accent then as well. And I think people were like, uh, you know, and so I did get rejected so many times. And also like there were so many times that I went up for things and they were like, oh, we don't want a woman, you know? So I'm like, oh my gosh. But these were things that I couldn't change. I can't change the way I look. I can't change that I'm a woman. I can't change the fact that I'm from Yorkshire. <laughs> and actually all these things are my assets. So what people might say is you're negative, you know, don't forget that. You know, yes, that might be one person's opinion, but it might be the other reason. It might be another person's reason that they actually want to work with you. Um, you know, so because it because it's not, you know, it's it is quite a tough industry. Um, and I think like what I did was I made contacts and um, I put myself out there because I didn't have any contacts. I didn't have any money. I didn't know anybody. You know, I don't have. I'm not somebody's you know, daughter that works in this industry. Like I didn't even know anybody in London. I moved to London, you know, with nothing and not knowing anybody. And I just started to make contacts and started to plug away, put myself on courses. I put myself on a journalism course. I used other jobs to pay my way. Like I worked as a personal trainer um, and taught fitness to try and pay. I did modeling as well. And I just kept on striving and kept on learning my craft, which is really important. Learn your craft you know, make sure you know what you're talking about. And that's how I got into sports broadcasting because I remember going up for my very first um, job um, and I got the job, but I think it was over a thousand people went for the job. And I remember somebody saying to me, oh, you should go, you should go for this job. And it was in football and I knew football like the back of my hand. I've been going to football games since I was a child. I play football, um, you know, and it was my love. Like I was brought up in Sheffield. It's a huge footballing city um, and I remember going up for this interview and I walked in and I was the only one wearing I was wearing a pair of jeans I remember exactly a pair of ripped jeans a white t-shirt and I'd got massive high heels on long blonde hair and I walked in and I was like oh my gosh like everybody was wearing a suit everybody was at least 10 years older than me and I probably spotted two other women and, and everybody else was a man and I, I nearly walked out like I very nearly walked out because I was just like Pff. like you know I'm not going to get this like I'm not good enough you know all these people are better than me and I think just you know even though you have those voices just ignore them <laughs> just just you know just do it because you never know what might happen um, and it turns out I got the job and I got the job not because you know I don't know, like I obviously wasn't wearing a suit, but not because of all those things. And obviously you do have to, you know, make sure you're, you know, you dress how you want to be perceived and all these kind of things. But at the same time, they gave me the job because I knew my stuff. Like I was the one person in there that, that you know, I could talk about, about football all day long because it was my passion. And also like, you know, I, I think because... I thought I wasn't going to get it. I, I wasn't kind of scared like this. And I just talked and yeah, and I ended up getting the job and then I kind of pushed on from there really. And, you know, there's so many times that, you know, there's things that I'm like, Oh, like I worked so hard for and it didn't happen. But then there's so many things that I've worked so far hard for that have happened. And I think that's important to remember. No, we haven't reached equality in sport, but we've improved. I mean, we've improved even in since I started my career. I started my career in sport and there was just, there was no women's sport anyway, not real on a professional level. Um, there wasn't a grassroots level. Um, and, you know, for me, if I look at when I was younger, there's been so much change. Like I would never have seen, like I wanted to be a professional athlete, but I would never have seen that as a viable career path when I was younger, but it is now, which is amazing. So it has improved so much in that sense. And also when I started my career in terms of sports broadcast, when I was mainly doing sport, um, you know, there was like, I hardly ever worked with women ever. I mean, like in front of camera and behind camera, like, you know, ever, it was just, you know, it was, you know, a men's club. Um, so it's changed in that sense because we're seeing women women in front of camera more. We're seeing people play, play for professional sport. We're seeing women's coaches. Um, you know, we're seeing 
various different roles, but it's still not an equal playing field. I mean, even the conversation this year, um, you know, it was all about getting men's sport back. Nobody even cared about getting women's sport back. It was almost like, ah, get men's sport back, you know, because they that's where they see the majority and that's also where they see the money. So I think, you know, you can even see, which is really disappointing because we had the Women's World Cup last year and which, you know, which made massive steps, um, you know, in equality. But then, but then, you know, this year it's kind of like, the conversations hardly been about women's sport. Um, so I think like anything though, I think change takes time, but it is changing. I think it's going in the right direction, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. I mean, you still get people making comments about, you know, women's sport and things like that. But I think if you go and speak to young children, that's where you see the change and that's where it's important. Because it's those that, that those young children that are going to be kind of then become my age and have those opportunities. So, oh wow, sport, football, play it plays such a huge part of the conversation in terms of mental health for so many reasons. Um, you know, for an individual to go and do sport, it helps their mental health. For me, it's a massive savior. It's a crutch. It's like a therapy. It's my meditation. You know, it's it's. I couldn't not do it. I'd really struggle if I didn't um, do physical activity and sport. I'd really, really mentally struggle. So on an individual level, it's so important. But then on a community level, it gives people hope. It gives people community, you know, on a community level, um, you know, friendships, hope, safe, like a safe place. Um, And it's so important that, you know, and for young people, it's also a place that it can give you a sense of identity you know, a sense of achievement. It can help you fulfill potential. It can help you realize that, oh yeah, you can actually break those boundaries because that's what sport is about. But it also gives you, um, I'm going on so many levels because it's like so important an individual and then so important in a wider kind of cultural context, you know, but it also gives you like an amazing relationship with yourself, um, which is so important in terms of mental health and in terms of growth. But I think like, you know, just singling out on football, it's it's a place where, I mean, I've been to so many football matches and, you know, I've probably had nothing much in common with this person behind me, but I've got football in common with them and they support the same team as me. And then you have this conversation and like, it doesn't matter whether it's like somebody my age, a 16 year old, and then you've got like an 85 year old sat there and, it, and you can see the way it puts smiles on people's faces. But the thing is as well about sport, and I've done quite a lot of work with the EFL and mind on this, is that if you if you talk, if you use in sport, like I do a podcast called My Sport in Mind, and you can use sport as a way to create a conversation that might be quite difficult to normally have. And I think that's you know, you know, as a woman, I feel it's difficult sometimes to talk about mental health, but I know that for men, um, you know, due to gender stereotyping, it can be really difficult as well Um, and I have three brothers younger brothers and it's so important that you use certain things to be able to have that conversation around mental health and that's where football comes in and sport comes in as a whole Um, because it's that kind of safe area and safe place of football you know um, you know you're supporting your team and then it's opening those conversations that might be quite difficult to have here but if you put football there and sport there, then you can kind of like break those barriers to be able to have those conversations, um, you know, to talk about mental health and to get rid of the stigma 